this morning. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. All the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the I'll sing on that beautiful show. Life is old. I'll fly away to a home on God's left shore. I'll fly away. Whoa, whoa, fly away for glory. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll 
this is part two in a series that I bring to you called Positioning Yourself for the Ride. I'm a firm believer, and if you've lived long enough, you've seen it, that there was an era somewhere, era between some, some era, sometime between the 20s and the 60s, that the great Christian movement impacted this world. Amen? And then if you go back and you look at history, you begin about the 70s to see a decline to about two, the year 2000. And then if you look from 2000 to 2019, you even see a greater decline. I'm a firm believer that it's because the church didn't position itself to reach the next generation. I trust today that not only do we do this corporately as a church, position ourselves to reach those that are in need, but I pray that we position our lives individually to be who God wants us to be all the time, every day. I brought in this message last week that there were some bronc riders that had gone to a school, and I, I'm not, I don't have time to recap this morning, that some bronc riders had gone to school, and in this five-day school, they had done some training, but of all the training that they had, one of the most important things that they really majored on was them positioning themselves for the ride. So I encourage you, as you listen to the train pass by in the distance, I still say I like the mooing better with. I encourage you to think about positioning your life to be everything that God wants you to be and to hang on for the eight seconds, metaphorically, till the trumpet sounds. Amen? We've got to position ourselves for the ride. Some of you are going to remember this. Some of you are not. I remember when there was bus ministry. Remember bus ministry? Reaching churches that were running 60 and 70, now having 150. They were children. The adults didn't come. And then somebody decided, well, what if we get sued? Who cares? Amen. What if we get put in prison? Who cares? What if we go to jail? Who cares? And we lost. I can remember my sweet, my sweet papa. We may edit this part out. I do not want my mom calling me. I remember <laughs> there was a church. Everybody was competing with bus ministry. And so they had this one, this one church that they had a clown. They had a guy dressed up like a clown on their bus, and he would swallow goldfish. Y'all remember those, cra those crazy days? This was back in the 70s. I mean, they had everything in the world going. He'd swallow a goldfish with a string and then pull it back up. All the kids started riding their bus. <laughs> I mean, it was just this crazy competition. What I'm telling you today is now we gather in cowboy churches across the nation. And our motto is, as long as we don't compromise this word, whatever it takes to get them under the influence of the word, let's do it. So with that said, Brady's going to swallow a goldfish next Sunday. <laughs> if you guys want to go. I'm just kidding. You said you was all in, brother. Anyway, let's get on with the message. Pray for me today. God's, God's word is so special. I'm reminded of a funny joke. I've got to tell you this. We'll move forward. 
of the community service. You know, we all have community services a lot sometimes. I'm always amazed at community services that you can get together one Sunday a year and and worship together, but you don't get along enough to worship together, so you have six churches that were started from splits. Can I get an amen? But I always like this. After the community revival had concluded, three pastors were up at McDonald's discussing the results with another with, with one another. And the Methodist minister says, Man, this revival, this community revival worked out fantastic. Says, in fact, we got four new families into our church. And man, the Baptist preacher says, Well, he goes, We did better than that. Said, we got six new families into our church. The Presbyterian pastor says, we did better than all of y'all. We lost 10 families that were our biggest troublemakers in our church. (laughs) Amen. He had positioned himself. (laughs) Father in heaven, touch us today with your word. Father, break our hearts for our neighborhood break our hearts about our own selves be with my brother Kay Lanier be with Wanda bless Lion Camp Cowboy Church Father at the level that we strive to bless you. Because, Father, if, if we're a gathering place and that's it, Lord, we don't deserve your blessing. So I ask you to bless Line Camp at the same level that we bless you. And the church said amen. In Second Chronicles seven fourteen, if you'll turn in your Bible, it gives you a verse of scripture that is very familiar with all of us. It says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I, if you would say, then will I, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal, heal their land. We talked about last week that we're discussing God's people. We're not talking about the world. We're talking about God's people. When he says, if my people, which are called by my name. You see, it, it shows to me real hurriedly that sometimes even God's people can get out of position. Would you say Amen. Sometimes God's church, God's saints, God's children can get out of position from where they need to be. And he addressed it. He says, because if my people who humble themselves to come to me to begin with, but now they're no longer humble, uh, that, that prayed to, to, be, to be with me, but now they're not praying. And they were seeking my face at one time, and, and they had turned from their wicked ways, but it kind of alludes to the fact that, that maybe even after accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and you and I are aligned and positioned for what Christ has for us and where he wants us living, that if we're not careful, we can very easily get out of line. Can I get an amen? If you know for a fact your neighbor's been out of line lately, just look at him and go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm just kidding. Positioning ourselves to hear the very voice of God. I've heard people say sometimes, you know, I don't hear God. Well, you probably hadn't put yourself in the position to hear Him. Amen. Well, I don't, I don't, get, I don't, you know, God doesn't talk to me. Wow, that's a shame. <laughs> you need to position yourself. So last week we talked about the ma- one of the positions was to humble ourselves. And I thank you for, the, for your, your comments this week on that message and, and how God has, has blessed your life with it. But today I want to talk about that not only is it an humbling, he says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, but he says something else. There's a comma, and a comma means what? A part, comma means more to come. And so he says, if you will humble yourselves and pray. Well, what can we say in, in, a, in just a few moments about prayer? Let me help you. 
First and foremost, I want you to understand that prayer is participation. Would you say participation? Prayer is participation. The problem is you and I do not participate in prayer. We just talk to God until we're done. And when we're done, formally most of us say amen and then go about our business. Prayer is participation with God. Prayer is, watch this, it's not what? Hmm? It's not my, it's just me, dialogue, monologue, I just got them inverted. Monologue is what I give if I'm just talking, okay? It's not our monologue, which is what we give. In fact, most of us turn into a Shakespearean expert when we pray. Lord, Father in heaven, I glorify Jesus Christ, above whom you reign on this world. Would you? And boy, we just go to this huge Shakespearean prayer. We used to have a deacon at First Baptist Church in Anacoco, Louisiana, that when he would say the offering prayer, you could eat two Big Macs, a fry, and a medium Coke before he finished. It was a, probably a beautiful prayer, but a Shakespearean event, no doubt. Some of you know people that pray in the King James vernacular. <laughs> Lord God, thine of heaven. Really? <laughs> Listen to me. Jesus just wants you and I to talk to him. Prayer is participation. It's supposed to be a dialogue, not a monologue. How many times do you and I go to the Lord in prayer, say we've got to say, and then boop, we're out? Amen? Have you ever had a, someone ask you a question, and before you can even get them their answer, they're asking you more about that question, and you're trying to answer them, but they won't quit talking long enough for you to answer them, and you want to say, well, if you shut up, I would tell you. But you can't, right? I don't know that God feels that way, but I think sometimes if we would just hush long enough for the Lord to speak to our hearts, he would. Prayer, if my people will not only humble themselves, but they will position themselves in prayer. Let me tell you what Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 says about taking time to listen. It says, and your ears will hear a word behind you. This word will be this is the way, walk in it. If you need direction this morning in your life, if you need answers this morning in your life, if you have some things that you're dealing with, you say, Lord, do I, do I go this direction? Lord, do I go that direction? So many times if we would just stop talking and listen, we'll hear that still, small, sweet voice behind us leading us. The Bible says the righteous man, his path will be led of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let me give you number two about prayer. Not only prayer being something that, that you and I need to declare that it is participation, but you and I need to know that prayer is expectation. Prayer is expectation. What is expectation? Expectation is that this Wednesday I will be, I will turn 57 years old. Wednesday is my birthday. There are still three shopping days left if you have <laughs> any interest I will be 57 years old anticipation is that while D has me on a diet I'm thinking I'm anticipating that she's going to make a smaller version of a German chocolate cake that I so adore can I say amen <laughs> amen I'm anticipating that prayer is an expectation Hebrews 6 tells it like this, anyone who wants to approach God, say approach God. Anyone who wants to approach God, there's two things here in this scripture. We don't talk about them a lot. But anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to whatever you say. I can remember when my daughter was growing up as a teenager, and she may still be this way. I'm not sure how they work me as an adult relationship. But when she was a teenager, if she wanted something from the father, 
she had an advocate. She knew that if she came to me, I may say no. But she knew if mama came to me first and paved the way, let me introduce y'all to John the Baptist at the Strother House. <laughs> this is John the Baptist at the Strother House paving the way. But she knew if she would get mom to pave the way first, that when she came to me, watch this, and she positioned herself right. I don't mean all this head shaking and cockiness. I'm talking about climbing up in that lazy boy with me, put her arms around me and tell me how much she loved her daddy and said, Daddy, can I? And I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> Why? She positioned herself to the Father. Listen to me. Metaphorically, the Father needs you and I to position ourselves with right with him and quit barking orders about how he needs to handle things in our life and just say, Lord, I'm just counting on you. Lord, I'm just counting on you for this thing. See, we tell God how to do, but we need to ask in a way that there's expectation. I love this in Romans. It says to speak those things. This is one of mine and Joey's favorite verses. To speak those things that do not exist as though, call them as they already do. Amen. Hey, man, our brother Kay Lanier, either this week will have a, uh, either have an open heart surgery or he will have a stent put in. Very serious time for the Lanier family right now. Listen to me. I'm speaking God's healing as even though it doesn't exist at this time. I'm speaking God's healing on my brother. Amen. Amen. We're going to speak those things. They don't exist right now, but we're going to speak them as though they already do. Uh, there's an expectation that comes in prayer. I love this verse of scripture right here, and it's so misunderstood many times. Mark chapter 11, verse 23 says, Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. I've misused that verse of scripture so many times in my life. Brother Joey, but listen to me. What Mark is telling us in that verse of Scripture is that when you pray, you need to pray believing and expecting God. Listen to me. You can't have expectations of the Father if you don't have the right relationship with him. You see, Jocelyn could come to me and, I don't know, spot brat, got everything she ever wanted, so I don't even have a good story. But she could come to me and, and need $100, and all she had to do was ask. She didn't wonder if she was going to get it. When we leave out the door this, this morning, if you ask me for $100, <laughs> have no expectation. <laughs> Why? You haven't positioned yourself with the Father. Amen? Amen. You're not in the bloodline. When we are in the bloodline, in the right position, we can ask of the Father and know that he hears our voice. So not only is there an expectation, let me give you this, the third and last thing. There is a proclamation that needs to be made. There's a proclamation that needs to be made. You know, when couples get married, isn't it exciting? It's just exciting when, when couples get married. And y'all didn't say a word, so... <laughs> I said, isn't it exciting when couples get married? <laughs> yes. Been a long time. Amen. <laughs> Y'all are awful. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to have to ask for an amen on that one. <laughs> isn't it great when couples get married? <laughs> well, let's go to the next point. That one didn't work. And Well, fake it because they're making a proclamation of their love for each other. Amen? They're making a proclamation of their commitment to each other. It's not that they just said it to each other, but it's important enough that now they're saying, you know what? We're going to join in holy matrimony because first and foremost, it's God's plan. But number two, watch, I'm proclaiming my love for you. Amen? I'm proclaiming, I'm, I'm making an announcement. Let me, give, let me tell you something that Webster said. He said it's a public or official announcement. Watch, especially one dealing with a matter of great importance. Do you have something important in your life today that you need to pray about? Make a proclamation. 
Amen. Make a proclamation about that thing. Here's some words that are synonymous with that. A decree, a declaration, a pronouncement, a statement. Man, I remember when I asked Dee to marry me, and, and she said yes. <sighs> Pitter-patter my heart. That was an awesome day. And I remember it wasn't very long, and it was before we were married, and she had done something. And the, the, you know, I mean, she, anyway, guys, you understand, say so amen. <laughs> she had done something, and it was still before we got married. And I remember one day just there in my prayer life, I was like, Lord, Lord, how, how come you give her such beautiful blonde hair? And he said, I, the Lord said, so, so you would fall in love with her. And I said, Lord, how, how come did you give her such beautiful Bambi eyes to flash at me? And he says, so, so that you would fall in love with her. And I said, Lord, how come you just, and I'll, I'll kind of ad-lib this a little bit. I, and I said, Lord, how come you just make her just look so cute to me? And he said, so you'd fall in love with her. And I said, but Lord, Lord, how, how come you make that woman without a brain and he said so she would so she would fall in love with you <laughs> a proclam i'm just guess a joke baby a joke. <laughs> listen we made a proclamation we made a proclamation of our love for each other now listen the world wants to silence the church and their proclamation today. I refused to be silenced. Can I get an amen? I refused. I refused to be silenced. I want to give you this in closing. Daniel chapter 3, verse 13. I'm going to read these scriptures to you. Then, keep, then King Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and a fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar spoke to them, saying, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I've set up for you? See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had positioned themselves with God, the true and living Jehovah God, and that's the only person they were going to serve. And now, he says, if you were ready at the time, you're going to hear the sound of the horn blow. And in sympathy with all kinds of music, I expect you to fall down and worship the image which I've made good. If you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able. And, and here's, anyway, i got to end of one scripture. He says, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the fire. Here's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. If that is the case, and they got in position, if that is the case, then our God whom we serve will deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. He will deliver us from your hand, O king. That was a declaration <laughs> with expectation of men who had positioned themselves with God. It made King Nebuchadnezzar mad, and it says he was full of fury. And with the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, meaning he felt different about them. And he spoke and commanded they heat up the furnace seven times more than was usually heated. And these men were bound in their coats, this is verse 19, their trousers, their turbans, and their garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning fire. Therefore, because of the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, watch what it says, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was a hot place to be. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished as he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did, he, we, did we not cast three men into the fire? They answered and said, True, O king. It is only three. And the king says, well, look, I see four men, and they're loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the first, fourth, is like the Son of God. Position yourself for your miracle. Position yourself for your blessing. I believe a lot of blessings pass us because we were just in the wrong position. I want to think 
that they was inside the fiery furnace. It says they were walking around. <laughs> and I don't know what they were singing, but I'd like to think, blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I don't know. Maybe they were singing, clap your hands, everybody. Amen. What I'll know is this. They knew that they had positioned themselves in the right position with Christ, and their expectation was high. Here's what's amazing in this verse of Scripture, Doc, if you'll come. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angels and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, any nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces. And their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. There's no other God. Position yourself for the ride. The older I get, the more seems to be going wrong in this body. Without hurting myself, something new can go to hurt me. Can I get an amen? I can sit and watch TV and get up and be like, whoa. Mm. Pop, snap, crackle, and like. I got to move a little bit. I think sometimes we get old as Christians. And we get out, as a chiropractor would say, we get out of alignment with the God. Maybe this morning you need to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and do a work in your heart, do a work in your mind, do a work in your attitude, do a work in your thoughts, and get in line humility and prayer to position yourself for your blessing every head bowed every